Welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing groups of order p squared. Okay, so in this next video what we want to do is prove the main theorem of this video, that if you have a group of order p squared, it's either isomorphic to the cyclic group uh, on the set of p squared elements, or it's isomorphic to the cyclic group on the set of p elements, direct producted with the cyclic group on the set of p elements. Okay, so we'll call this final theorem, theorem 3 here. Okay, so theorem 3, and I'll just colour it in in purple here. Okay, right, so we're going to have, uh, once again, this group which we'll call capital P here, which has order a prime number squared. Okay, and what we want to prove then so to prove is that P is either isomorphic to the cyclic group on the set of P squared elements, or P is isomorphic to the cyclic group on the set of P elements, direct producted with the cyclic group on the set of P elements. And this isn't too difficult at all to actually prove this. Okay, right. So. Firstly, we'll start off with case 1, which is where P is isomorphic to the cyclic group on the uh, set of P-squared elements. Now note, the group capital P has order P-squared, so if you take an arbitrary element of the group capital P, then if we consider the order of that element, so let's say A is an element of capital P, if we consider the order of that element, which remember is the order of the cyclic subgroup that that element would generate, it is going to have to divide the order of the group. Okay, so it's going to have to be either equal to 1 or P or P squared. Those are the only options, so it's equal to 1 or P or P squared. Now there's only one element in the entire group that will have order 1, and that's the identity element, which will generate as its cyclic subgroup, the trivial subgroup. Okay, so we can rule that one out, provided that A is not the uh, identity element, so we're assuming that A is not equal to the identity element. Therefore, the order of this element must either be P or P squared. So in case 1 here, where P is going to be isomorphic to the cyclic group on the set of P squared elements, then of course what's going to exist is there is going to exist an element in our group capital P which has order P squared. So I'll put this as case 1. So case 1 is that there exists what we'll call little a is an element of capital P such that the order of little a is equal to p squared, and hence this element can generate the entire group capital P. Okay, all elements of the group can be written as a power of little a here, uh, and truly then uh, the group capital P is isomorphic to the cyclic group on the set of p squared elements uh, with generator a. So in this case, P is going to be isomorphic to the cyclic group on the set of p-squared elements. Case 2, the other option, is that um, there is no such element in the group such that the order of that element is equal to p-squared. Okay, so case 2 now, and case 2 is going to be the case where the group ends up being isomorphic to the cyclic group on the set of P uh, elements, direct producted with the cyclic group on the set of P elements. Now firstly actually, um, what I should say is that both of these groups exist. This group exists and this group exists, and they both will be groups of order P squared. So the first thing to say is that these are two examples of groups of order P squared. What we're now showing is that if I've got an arbitrary group of order P squared, it's isomorphic to one or the other. So case one is where there is some element of order P squared, and in that case, of course, our group of order P squared is going to be isomorphic to the cyclic group on the set of P squared elements. Case 2 now is going to be the case where there is no element in the group capital P of order P squared. So what I can now conclude is that for all elements in my group apart from the identity, so apart from the identity element, the order of this element is equal to P, okay, the only other option. So there is no element of order P squared. And in this case, I claim that we can conclude that the group capital P is isomorphic to the cyclic group on the set of P elements, direct producted with the cyclic group on the set of P elements, but that's going to require some proof. Okay, so let's go with this now. Okay, so 
if all the elements of the group apart from the identity element have order p, then if I pick some arbitrary element, it will have order p. So I'm going to pick an arbitrary element, which I'll call little x here, and I'm going to generate the cyclic subgroup generated by x. Okay, so this is going to have order p. So this is going to be a subgroup of p of order, uh, of capital P rather, of order little p. Okay. Now what I want to do is I want you to find me an element which we'll call little y, which is in capital P that is outside of the cyclic subgroup generated by x, and therefore in particular is not going to be equal to the identity element. Oh, and by the way, when I picked a little x, I assumed it wasn't the identity element. I assumed I was picking an element of order P and generating the cyclic subgroup, therefore, of order P. Now what I want you to do is find me some other element that's outside of the cyclic subgroup generated by x. So it's not going to be the identity either, because the identity is inside of there, and it's not going to be any power of x either. So I'm finding some other element. And of course now what I can conclude is that the subgroup generated by the two elements, x and y, and if you're not familiar with this, please do watch the video on subgroups generated by subsets of groups. Okay, uh, the subgroup generated by x and y, this must be equal to the improper subgroup. This must be equal to the entire subgroup, because it has to be bigger than the cyclic subgroup generated by x, which has order p, so it's got to have order greater than p. Okay, but then there's only one option because of the fact that the order of this group, capital P, is p squared. The only option then by Lagrange's theorem is that the order of this is equal to p squared, and therefore uh, the subgroup generated by x and y is equal to the entire group capital P. But as we discuss in the video on um, subgroups generated by subsets of a group, we can construct this. There is a way to construct this. Okay, the way of constructing this is by taking all uh, finite products of elements from the set that we're using, which is the set just containing x and y here, and their inverses. Okay, now because x and y both have order equal to p, uh, what you can conclude is that their inverses are just themselves to the power of p minus 1. So the inverse of x is just x to the power of p minus 1, and the inverse of y is just y to the power of p minus 1. So what we need to do is construct the set containing all finite products of x, y, x to the power of p minus 1, and y to the power of p minus 1. But because we know that p is abelian by theorem 2, this becomes extremely simple. Okay, so to construct this set, and I think I'll go on to the other side uh, to do this. So to construct the set, uh, or rather the subgroup, generated by x and y, all you have to do is take all finite products of x, y, x to the power of p minus 1, and y to the power of p minus 1. But as I say, because it's abelian, all you can do is just rearrange all of those finite products so that you group together all of the powers of x and group together all of the powers of y. So this becomes extremely easy. All of the elements in this subgroup are just going to be x to the power of i, y to the power of j. They're going to be of this form, where i is going to be some power 0, 1, to all the way up to p minus 1, and j is going to be some power 0, 1, 2, all the way up to p minus 1. Those are all the products that you're going to get. If it was non-abelian, then of course this would be much more complicated to construct this, because you'd have to consider all of the different combinations separately of, of elements x, y, x to the power of p minus 1, y to the power of p minus 1, but because it's abelian, it hugely simplifies. Okay. You can just cluster together all of the powers of x, cluster together all the powers of y, cancel them all out uh, as need be with the understanding that x to the power of p is going to equal the identity element and y to the power of p is going to equal the identity element, uh, and therefore get things of this form. Okay, so here I claim is the subgroup generated by x and y, and of course we know that this has to equal p. Now I claim that I know instantly that all of these different powers uh, of x and y are separate. All of these are separate elements in the group. And you might be worried about that. You might be worrying, what, well, how do I know that, for instance, x to the power of 3, y to the power of 2 isn't equal to x to the power of 6, y to the power of 1? How do I know that all of these are distinct, where i 
if I have a specific value for i and a specific value for j, how do I know that it's not equal to another one of these in here when I actually work it out? Well, the reason I can conclude that is that this truly is going to be what I have to work out in order to construct this. And I know that when I do construct this, I end up with p, the entire group, capital P. This group has order p squared. How many elements does this set have in it? Well, there's p options for i, p options for j, so at present, if all of these are distinct, it has p squared elements in. And there's your argument as to why all of these have to be distinct, because if they weren't distinct, I'd have fewer than p squared elements in here, so how could it possibly equal p, which I know it has to equal? Okay, so that's your argument as to why all of these um, elements in here have to be distinct, why uh, a certain power of i and a certain power of j isn't going to be the same as some different certain power of i and certain power of j. Okay, so all of these truly are going to be different answers. Okay, and there, that is how you can construct the subgroup generated by x and y uh, in the group capital P. And the good thing about this is now this completely characterizes my group capital P. All the elements of the group capital P are of this form, some power of x composed with some power of y, where, as I say, the power of i, um, sorry, the power of x is 0, 1, all the way up to p minus 1, and again, the power of j is 0, 1, all the way up to p minus 1. Now, let's understand how composition is going to work, okay? If I want to compose two of these together, so if I've got x to the i, oops, uh, y to the j, ignore that, uh, the miswritten bit there, okay, and I want to now compose it with x to the power of k, y to the power of l, how would I do this? Well, of course, this is really simple because I know that p is abelian. Just move them around, okay, so move the power of x's next to each other and the powers of y's next to each other, so just swap these two around, and then combine the powers, so x to the power of i composed of x to the power of k is just going to be x to the power of i plus k, y to the power of j plus times y to the power of l is just going to be y to the j plus l here. And of course, what you'll have to do is you'll then have to take these powers modulo the prime p, okay? Because you'll acknowledge that x to the power of p is equal to the identity and y to the power of p is equal to the identity. So if either of these sums goes over p, you'll pull the p bit out and get rid of it because it's just equal to the identity. So you'll take these sums modulo p. Okay, right. So that's the structure of this group, and I claim that that is completely isomorphic now to the cyclic group on the set of p elements direct producted with the cyclic group on the set of p elements. So let's just have a little bit of a study of this, uh, and then we'll see how it's isomorphic to this. Okay, right. Uh, so remember when we construct this, what we want to do is we want to take all the ordered pairs of an element of this group and an element of this group. If I call the elements of this group powers of x, if I have x to the 0, x to the power of 1, all the way up to x to the power of p minus 1, okay, with the uh, natural composition law on it, and if I call the, the elements of this one powers of y, okay, so again y to the power of 0, y to the power of 1, uh, all the way up to y to the power of p minus 1, let me just straighten this up a little bit. Okay, so equivalently with this one, I'll put it here, we'll have y to the 0 will be the identity, y to the 1, y to the 2, all the way up to y to the p minus 1. And as I say, composition, you just add the powers modulo p. Okay, so here this one is the orange one. Then if I was to direct product them, then what I have to construct is the set containing all the ordered pairs of an element from this one and an element from this one. So we'd have a power of x, so we'd have x to the i here, and we'd have a power of y here, yj here, okay, where again i is equal to 0, 1, all the way up to p minus 1, and j is equal to 0, 1, all the way up to p minus 1, like so. So this is the way that I construct all of the symbols for this group, and how would I define composition on this group? Well, of course, I'd do it component-wise. So if I, for instance, had um, x, i, y, j as one of the ordered pairs here, and then I had another uh, ordered pair, x to the k, y to the l, and I wanted to compose them together, I'd just compose this one with this one in the original group here in red. Okay, so component-wise, I compose these two together in the initial groups there, P in red, 
and I compose these two together, the second components, in their initial group, and of course this will become just x to the power of i plus k, where of course I would add these modulo p, and y to the power of j plus l, where again of course I'd add these modulo p, okay? So this is in the orange cyclic group on the set of p elements, and this is in the red cyclic group on the set of p elements. And hopefully it is obvious to you, therefore, that this is totally mirroring the structure of this. This is identical to this, just different symbols. x to the i, y to the j has just been replaced by this ordered pair, where you've got a comma now in between the x, i, y to the j, and some nice brackets around it, but you've just changed the symbol. The actual composition, though, is identical. I mean, that's made evident by this. Of course, you could establish an isomorphism if you liked. You could say that we will map this element, x to the i, y to the j, onto this element, and then you could prove compatibility. But I hope you have enough intuition about isomorphisms now that that is just obvious that these two are isomorphic that they are truly the same algebraic structure up to the fact that you've used different symbols. Okay, so there, then, is the proof that if uh, your group capital P has no element of order P squared, its structure then is going to be isomorphic to the direct product of the cyclic group on the set of P elements with the cyclic group on the set of P elements. Okay, and with that we will end this video.